The excerpts I'm going to look at today, I've chosen for a few specific reasons. First and foremost, it's what I have available to me in my home. Normally, I'm used to being able to play on instruments provided by the symphony, as well as the high schools I teach at, things like marimba, timpani. I don't own those myself. Also, these will sound somewhat decent in my ad lib recording studio. I will hopefully avoid the bird chirps. I've been fighting some birds outside the window here. Uh, it kind of sounds pleasant, but FYI, I apologize. Uh, thirdly, though, this is a nice range of instruments that represents the various skills we need to have as concert percussionists. I'm going to be looking at the glockenspiel, also known as the orchestra or concert bells, the snare drum, as well as the tambourine. The glockenspiel I talked about already a little bit with the maestro, the historical aspects of it. This version is somewhat new compared to the older keyboard style glockenspiels, which are really quite hard to find. The resulting issue, though, is that the keyboard style instrument with all the 10 fingers able to play lots of notes makes it harder for us as percussionists to do the same. So we have to invent things like three or four mallet technique, like in the Pines of Rome to play that effectively, or various sticking patterns and practice strategies to be able to play accurately lots of notes in a short amount of time. The magic flute, of course, as an opera, has one other magic instrument, the magic bells. They're played by Papagayano as a way to create safe passage on, it, passage on its journey. And you can hear it really prominently towards the very end of Act One. This is the first piece ever written for the glockenspiel, which I think is very interesting. And in fact, it took another 50, 60 years for the next thing to come along. I think it was Wagner uh, that started using the bells, and now we see it as a standard. But at some point, we had to slowly add that as part of the section. This instrument also is going to use really specialty mallets. These are the magic flute mallets made by Equilibrium Percussion, which is actually uh, founded by Michael Udow, former professor of percussion at the University of Michigan. He now lives down the road in Boulder County in Colorado, which I find interesting. But these mallets are skinnier in width, shorter in length, and have really small beads made out of brass. All of these things designed to create a dainty, magical, almost fairy-like sound, which we'd expect from something like magic bells from the opera. It sounds like this. To play that really effectively, I have a few different strategies that are important. Mallet percussion is one of the hardest instruments in terms of pitch accuracy because of what I call the disconnect. In other words, every time I come to the instrument and come away, my perspective of where exactly the notes are changes. Add into that things like foot shifts, for example, especially on larger instruments like the marimba or the vibraphone, and I have to really be ready to adjust. Also, Every instrument is a little bit different. Every mallet set is a little different. So all these things make it hard to make it accurate. In fact, this is a Musser glockenspiel, but it's a different model than the Musser glockenspiel that the Cheyenne Symphony owns. So I really have to use a couple strategies to help myself. One of those is to practice at really slow tempos. Muscle memory is great because it helps you to get over the hump as you're learning and becoming familiar with new music. The problem is muscle memory is actually the enemy of really refined uh, performance. So I'm going to grab my metronome, something I practice with religiously, and I'm going to go at half tempo. This is going to be 45 beats per minute compared to the normal roughly 90 beats per minute that that excerpt is usually played at. I'm not going to do the whole thing because it's pretty long, but you'll get the idea. By removing that normal tempo and having so much space between the notes, I have to know more up here as well as visually where my, uh, my pitches are located. The other thing that that does for me is it lets me improve my tone and phrasing. I'm always looking for a really clear, clean, singular attack when I hit those bars to get that 
bell tone quality that we all expect. It also gives me a chance by slowing it down to better understand the line or the shape I'm trying to create with that melody, especially in a solo such as this. Another strategy I'm going to use is to play it single-handed. Now, I'm not going to sort of cheat and let my extra hand kind of ghost note or gesture those motions. I'm going to hang my right hand to my side completely, let my left hand do all the motion. I'm going to go back to the normal tempo to give you an idea what that work looks like. Once again, I'm not able to use muscle memory in the same sense because I don't have the same full package of motion happening. Additionally, it's going to help me work on a little bit more abstract rhythms, and it's going to allow me by being able to focus just in on that one hand, maybe some technique errors that might be present when I whereas I don't notice that doing both hands together. So those are a couple strategies that are really helpful. I would also use those on the snare drum, but I'll show you a couple other things that make this instrument uh, really, really work. First and foremost, is to get the right kind of instrument, just like the mallets I'm using on that glockenspiel, I'm going to be using for the Scheherazade Movement 3 some sticks with really small beads because I want a delicate, small, articulate sound. I'm also going to be using a drum that's a little bit uh, narrower and shallower as well as heads that are thinner than you maybe have on a standard orchestral snare and certainly like on a drum set snare drum. Now those snare guts are there to make the sound initially deeper, more articulate, louder. If I take the snares off and play, sounds okay. Turn those snares on, you'll notice an immediate sound change, but as well that, again, that thicker, deeper, articulate, louder sound. Now I'm using a chamois cloth here for this excerpt, mostly to help it sound decent in this recording. Um, but nonetheless, it's going to thin my sound out even more as I play such a quiet volume in Scheherazade Movement 3. To play this effectively, I'm going to actually use another little trick. Now on the mallets, I'm playing the melody there. I don't have to necessarily think that along in my head. But on snare drumming, I don't have a pitch-oriented instrument here. So something like the duet in Scheherazade with the clarinet, I'm gonna actually sing, whistle sometimes I hum that sound out to make sure that I'm really lined up with the shaping and phrasing and balance with that player. Now, that certainly helps to shape the line, but the meat and potatoes of drumming comes down to rudiments. Rudiments are essentially the vocabulary we use to create longer lines of music. And rudiments, there's, a, there's officially 40 of them, but they've been around for many, many, many years. I think they were formalized into 40 rudiments uh, about 100 years ago. But even going back into uh, Swiss drumming, the people that invented the snare drum, they were using rudiments back then. Even today, rudiments are still being invented. Some of the more popular ones have some wacky names, such as cheese de chuttas. That's right, cheese. Uh, also, grandmas. Um, but the 40 official rudiments are a collection of different sounds to create, again, that line. One category are sticking rudiments. In other words, combinations of rights and lefts, the paradiddle being the most famous. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, paradiddle, paradiddle. Those sticking combinations not only create, again, line or phrase for the drums, but they can also help with things like glockenspiel, drum set, timpani. When I need to maybe turn around my motion to go up or down in pitch, having a double left or a double right is going to allow me to get that turnaround to happen. Another category of rudiments are what are called ornamentations or embellishments. These are going to sort of thicken up a sound. A regular tone can sound thicker with a flam, where I add a little grace note, even thicker as a rough or a drag. And again, the end of Scheherazade Movement 3, we see some really quiet drags, which are really fun to play. And a final category, which I want to look at, are roll rudiments. A roll in percussion is the illusion of sustain or duration by lots of frequent notes. Some of our instruments, like a vibraphone, have some sustain to them naturally, but a lot of them, like a snare drum, are very short sounds. So we create this illusion 
to make that length happen. It's also unique sounding itself and is worth using them just for that purpose alone. On a glockenspiel, if I played a roll, I would use a single stroke roll, which is just a quick alternation of the mallets. Like a dinner bell going off. You see that most commonly in percussion, bongo drums, timpani, suspended cymbals especially. Drumming doesn't use that too much, or at least in snare drums, I should say. Instead, we use two different kinds of rolls. One is the buzz roll, also known as the multiple bounce or closed roll. Another excerpt from Scheherazade Movement 3. Also in that excerpt, I used an open stroke or double stroke roll, specifically a seven stroke open roll. If you listen closely, there are seven individual hits, but notice I didn't motion seven times. What I did was a two for one stroke, where it's one gesture into the drum. That's those two sounds. This is really common, especially in rudimental drumming like you see in a marching band's drum line. So those are all going to help me to play the parts, not just in Scheherazade, but many different types of solos, etudes. They're really important to being able to create, again, shape and line and embellishment in a snare drum part beyond just on the core rhythms that, of course, we also have to do quite a bit of. The final instrument I was going to look, like, look at is the tambourine. And the reason I chose this is because it's sort of underrated. A lot of accessory or auxiliary percussion is so commonplace and they're small and simple. We tend to not give them as much credit as we would more difficult drums and mallet instruments. But this is such an important instrument in part because it's worldwide and it's ancient. You can see Greek pottery with pictures of people with the tambourine. And across the globe, there are people even, especially like in the Middle East, that are tambourine players professionally that really just play this one instrument, of course, with different names and different sizes, different shapes, different amounts of jingles, some with heads, some without. But it's a really universal instrument, which I think is a, a pretty cool. It connects us with the bigger percussion community. Now, a tambourine, of course, is not that hard to make a decent sound without much, in, without, without much effort. <laughs> not hard, sound good. But to play it with a refinement and an expertise is where I wanted to show you today. Now, I already mentioned rolls. Now, the tambourine is a little different because we have two different types of rolls that are pretty unique to this instrument. One is the shake roll. That's just a quick alternation of the wrist back and forth, like you were trying to jiggle a doorknob that's stubborn, for example. Now, the key there is to make sure that I have a balance of motion and angle so one side of the uh, motion doesn't sound heavier and separated compared to the other side. Another type of roll is the thumb or finger roll. These are lots of fun to play. Once you get good at it, it takes a little bit of time. The idea is that you're going to uh, use your finger or thumb to sort of skip across the head like a rock being skipped across the surface of a pond. Sounds like this. I use that to create lighter sounding rolls as well as shorter sounding rolls. Theoretically, if you can do a, th a finger roll on a tambourine, you think also can effectively do it on lots of other instruments. For example, I should be able to get it on the snare drum. Or maybe the bells. These don't work quite as well because they're not as uh, resonant and vibrating. A little bit there. It sounds really cool, especially on a concert bass drum. Sort of it sounds like a whale call, uh, which is a lot of fun. To help myself out, a couple tricks. One is the angle of the tambourine, as well as where I'm playing on the head. And I'm going to add a little bit of beeswax to the side. And a lot of times I actually wet my finger with some moisture just a little bit because, again, that's going to help me create some friction. As I push down and out, it sort of pulls on the skin underneath the fingernail. That's the basic idea. As I hop across, of course, a normal roll, it's going to connect that more consistently. A few of the things to think about with the tambourine are the type of tone and depth that you want to make. If you're playing kind of louder sounds, you're going to play on the head. And you can hear a little bit of sustain from that head ringing after contact. But what if I had to play some really quiet sounding music? What I can do is invert the tambourine. I'm going to put the head against my leg. I'm going to put my gut up and over the edge of the back side of the tambourine. I'm going to play just with some fingertips over a single set of jingles. For example, a Spanish rhythm right there. So it gives me a lot of range of sounds as I need to be able to adjust across the varying repertoire of the orchestra. One last thing I'll leave you with is the hand-knee technique. This is heard, for example, in the Nutcracker Russian dance Trepak, 
This is used when you have to play medium or loud sounds, but fast rhythms. I'm not going to grab mallets or drumsticks and hit the side of my tambourine. First and foremost, it's going to destroy my tambourine. Secondly, it makes a kind of unpleasant sound because you get a lot of what's called contact noise. You're going to get a clicking sound of that wood on wood. So instead, I'm going to play on the top of my kneecap with my other hand in the center of the head. So in the trepak sound, I'm doubling that rhythm on the tambourine, but I can only do that with this special sound because eventually I'm going to run out of chops to be able to play that just single-handedly fast enough. So it's a really fun technique that I like to show people and help them learn that things like the tambourine or castanets or triangle, though they are small, though they are more simple, they have a lot of depth behind them, and I like to uh, educate people and entertain them a little bit with some of those tidbits. Thanks for watching. I hope this was informative to you, and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about what it takes to be an orchestral percussionist.